we have looked at in the last class that in the case of a mode 1 loading the crack will propagate in a self similar manner. Then we said when you go to the case of pure mode 2 the crack will propagate at an angle which you have to find out from the appropriate criteria and we have looked at the criteria of energy balance and I said it is essentially useful for coplanar crack extension. Then we looked at the criteria that allow estimation of crack growth direction. I had mentioned maximum principal stress criterion originally when this was introduced it is known as maximum tangential stress criterion. As long as you use only the first term in the asymptotic series expansion the maximum principal stress as well as maximum tangential stress sigma theta theta both the directions coincide. And we had also developed the expression for finding out the crack growth direction based on this theory. The other theory which you could get crack growth direction is from strain energy density theory and in this crack and our mixed loading will extend in the direction of minimum strain energy density. We will go back and review the crack growth direction in MTS uh, criteria. you have to make the shear stress 0. So, the key equation is this k 1 sin theta m plus k 2 3 cos theta m minus 1 equal to 0. After some simplification you could get the expression for crack growth direction you have this as tan theta m divided by 2 equal to 1 by 4 k 1 by k 2 plus or minus 1 by 4 square root of k 1 by k 2 whole square plus 8. So, you will have to calculate the value of theta m from this out of the two roots which root is admissible that you will have to select. So, in this what you are actually looking at in a given problem for the type of loading estimate the value of k 1 and k 2. So, this expression would give in which direction crack can possibly grow, but for crack to proceed by fracture it has to reach the instability condition. What is that instability condition that also we will have to look at it, but before we go into that we will also see the comparison of results from experiments. And what you have here is on this axis k 1 by k 2 is plotted it varies from 0 to 1. So, that means the horizontal axis whatever that you have here this is for a pure mode 2 situation. At the top of the graph you have this as k 1 equal to k 2. So, you have one segment where you go from mode 2 to the situation where the effect of mode 1 and mode 2 are equivalent. In the other one mode 1 is dominant you go from mode 1 to the situation where k 1 equal to k 2. So, this axis is in terms of k 1 by k 2 ratio this axis is in terms of k 2 by k 1 ratio. And these graphs are drawn based on this uh, expression and what you see as red dots they are from experiment. And what I would do is I would uh, enlarge this and uh, you could see clearly when k 1 is dominant the experimental data point reasonably matches with the maximum tangential stress criterion. When k 2 is dominant you do not have that kind of uh, good comparison and the maximum tangential stress criterion gives that angle as somewhere around minus 70 
whereas test result is minus 56 is way off from the predicted value. And you could see that the crack will extend in a direction as shown here. So, you have this angle as minus of uh, theta m and we will also see what the other theories give when you have pure mode 2 situation. When you have pure mode 1, the crack grows in a self similar manner. When mode 1 is dominant, the theoretical as well as experimental predictions reasonably match. That also gives you some kind of a comfort that whatever the expression that we have got is explaining certain observed phenomena. Next we move on to what is the condition for onset of fracture. I think this is where we had stopped in the last class and the idea which I want to convey is you know we are used to conventional design approach. In conventional design approach what we were doing in a real situation you may have combined loading. However, to assess whether yielding would occur or not, we would take the result from a simple tension test whatever the value of yield strength you get, use it in an appropriate way for your combined loading situation also. You also have multiple theories, you had Trusca yield criteria as well as one minus yield criteria, you did not have one theory, but the focus is from a material point of view whatever the parameter that you want, you do it from one single test. So, in this fracture instability analysis also, you look at what is the value of sigma theta theta at any value of theta m and in a mode 1 situation, this value should go to the k 1 should go to k 1 c. So, based on that you use this for any value of theta m also. So, that means, for a given problem situation find out k 1 and k 2, use the fracture toughness which is obtained for a mode 1 situation to assess whether the crack will propagate or not. Very similar to what you are used to in conventional design approach. In conventional analysis, you take the yield strength from simple tension test. Here, you focus only on mode 1 fracture toughness, even though it is a combined loading situation. And we have to see whether the expression whatever we have got that is k 1 c equal to k 1 cos cube theta m divided by 2 minus 3 k 2 cos square theta m divided by 2 into sin theta m by 2 reasonably models the experimental situation. People have found that it matches with experiments and that is what you see here. You have data of k 1 and k 2 plotted on the x and y axis and you have this done for uh, two different uh, materials. The circles and triangles are from experiments and the line is from the condition that you have k 1 c equal to k 1 cos cube theta m by 2 minus 3 k 2 cos square theta m by 2 sin theta m by 2. So, what you will have to do is in a given problem find out the value of k 1 and k 2 for the given loading also determine the, the direction in which crack can propagate. So, use that theta m and find out whether this quantity is equal to k 1 c or not. If it is equal to k 1 c, then fracture would occur in that particular direction. This is found to be satisfied for a class of materials, because like one Mises and Tresca they are not applicable for all materials. Some materials obey one Mises criteria better than Tresca. So, 
in fracture also you will have multiple theories people are still working on a reliable comprehensive theory is not yet developed you have to find out theory for your own application and you also have what is the limiting value of k2c which could be expressed in terms of k1c we would see such expressions uh, a little while later now we move on to the next theory which is strain energy density criteria and what you are saying here is crack growth will occur in the direction of minimum strain energy density so you have s which is a function of theta divided by r equal to 1 by r a 1 1 k 1 squared plus 2 a 1 2 k 1 k 2 plus a 2 2 k 2 squared and these coefficients are defined these coefficients are defined with a value of kappa by choosing kappa appropriately you could get the expression for plane stress as well as plane strain. See what you will have to notice in the case of maximum tangential stress criterion, you never discussed about plane stress or plane strain. Whereas, when you come for strain energy density criterion, you have separate expressions available and A 1 1 is given as 1 by 16 g into pi, where g is the shear modulus multiplied by 1 plus cos theta kappa minus cos theta a 1 2 equal to 1 by 16 g pi sin theta 2 cos theta minus kappa plus 1 a 2 2 is 1 by 16 g pi kappa plus 1 multiplied by 1 minus cos theta plus 1 plus cos theta multiplied by 3 cos theta minus 1. When you use kappa equal to 3 minus 4 nu, the expressions are for plane strain. When kappa is replaced by 3 minus nu divided by 1 plus nu, it is for plane stress. So, here again you will find out how to calculate the direction at which crack will initiate and a condition for what combination of k 1 and k 2 fracture may initiate that we would again go back to simple mode 1 situation. So, we would again use only k 1 c we will not use k 1 c and k 2 c to assess onset of crack growth. So, it is very similar to your conventional procedure. So, we have already mentioned crack extension occurs in the direction for which s is a minimum and theta m follows from d s by d theta equal to 0 and your d squared s by d theta squared should be greater than 0. So, if you have multiple roots check the second condition and identify only one root. So, extension of crack occurs along theta m at the point when s achieves a material dependent critical value s c s critical. And here again mode 1 come to the rescue in mode 1 the crack growth is self similar see what people have found is if you have a crack in a mixed mode loading also the crack will tend to propagate in such a manner the stress is it will become a mode 1 type of crack. The role of mode 2 and mode 3 is to deflect the crack path in such a manner the crack will experience essentially mode 1 loading that is how crack aligns itself. And one of the reasons we have been paying more attention on mode 1 was it is the most significant modes of failure. So, what you find here is in mode 1 the crack extension is self similar and thus theta m equal to 0 and find out what is the corresponding value of strain energy density critical. 
and that is given as by substituting in the appropriate expression you get this as S c equal to a 1 1 k 1 c square and if you simplify that it has only k 1 role there is no role of k 2 then S c becomes 2 into kappa minus 1 divided by 16 g pi multiplied by k 1 c square. And what you find here is this critical value of strain energy density is used to investigate the onset of crack growth in generic loading two. And if you look at the expression would be like this. So, in the case of strain energy density criterion you find out for a given loading the values of k 1 as well as k 2. Then find out this value 16 g pi divided by 2 into k minus 1 kappa minus 1 a 1 1 k 1 square plus 2 a 1 2 k 1 k 2 plus a 2 2 k 2 square in such a manner that you substitute theta equal to theta m in the expressions whole power half if it is equal to k 1 c then crack would initiate at an angle theta m. This is given by strain energy density criterion and principal stress criterion or maximum tangential stress criterion you have k 1 cos cube theta m divided by 2 minus 3 k 2 cos square theta m divided by 2 sin theta m divided by 2 if it is equal to k 1 c then crack initiation would occur. So, you have at least two theories I have shown and you have to anticipate that they will not give same result when you go for a real life situation. So, we will see for a pure mode 2 case what way these theories give the values. In the case of pure mode 2 the crack growth is at an angle and we have already seen that the crack is expected to grow like this and if you look at the results from the two theories which we have recently looked at the maximum tangential stress criterion predicts this angle as minus 70.6 degrees and the corresponding value of critical value of k2 is 0 0.866 times k 1 c. On the other hand if you go for strain energy density criterion and if you consider Poisson ratio equal to 1 by 3 and if you take the plane strain situation the crack extension angle is minus 83.62 degrees. Obviously, they do not match from one point of view. Another point of view you can say both give crack growth angle in the negative direction they are not way off you know this is the way that you will have to look at it. And what is the value at which uh, uh, the crack initiation occurs in one, one case it is 0 0.866 times k 1 c in S e d it is 0 0.905 k 1 c here at least the difference is not that much. So, this you will not accept the problem is so complex and you do not have a valid theory which is useful when mode 1 is dominant, but they are not really good when mode 2 is dominant that is what the result uh, pictures. So, what people have thought people have gone for developing theories based on empirical approaches we would also see that. You know there was an experimental work by Wu in 1967. He conducted a series of tests on orthotropic materials such as balsa wood and fiberglass reinforced plastic plates. In this cracks along the direction of the grain in balsa wood and along the fiber direction in the fiberglass reinforced plastic plates were considered. 
the specimens are tested under pure tension perpendicular to the crack, combined tension and shear and pure shear. So, it is done for mode 1, mixed mode as well as pure mode 2. In all these cases, the cracks were found to extend along an essentially straight line collinear with the original crack. So, you will call this as coplanar crack extension or self similar crack growth, this is what Wu has observed, but he handled orthotropic materials, it is not an isotropic material. He found that an empirical relationship of the form k 1 by k 1 c power a plus k 2 by k 2 c power b equal to 1 reasonably models the behavior and for the cases he considered a equal to 1 and b equal to 2 was found to be sufficient. So, you have to note here the final expression is obtained in an empirical fashion. This empirical relation uses the fracture toughness in mode 1 as well as mode 2 in arriving at the result. In the earlier cases we had used only k 1 c here both k 1 c and k 2 c are used and the form is given like this k 1 by k 1 c power a plus k 2 by k 2 c power b equal to 1. This comes from an empirical approach and this is the paper that he has published this was in 1967 application of fracture mechanics to anisotropic plates. A semi journal of applied mechanics in the pages 967 to 974. And if you look at people have taken advantage of this and you also have graphs which depict uh, the type of variation as a function of k 1 and k 2. And what you have here is I have one graph drawn which is essentially a circle, I get this as k 1 squared plus k 2 squared equal to k 1 c squared, this essentially comes from your energy balance criterion. This is valid only for coplanar crack extension. Here when you take the graph as k 1 by k 1 c whole squared plus k 2 by k 2 c whole squared equal to 1 you have taken a equal to 2 and b equal to 2. This is an equation of an ellipse which uses k 1 c as well as k 2 c and what the literature says is such a expression is also useful for non coplanar extension because it is empirical formulation. If you come from energy balance criterion you will have only k 1 square plus k 2 square equal to k 1 c square. If you divide it by k 1 c square and k 2 c square appropriately, the formulation is empirical in nature and people all have also done it for the combination of mode 1, mode 2 and mode 3, there the expressions looks like for a plane strain situation k 1 by k 1 c whole square plus k 2 by k 2 c whole square plus 1 by 1 minus nu multiplied by k 3 by k 3 c whole square equal to 1. See the crank growth direction does not stop here, people have observed kinking as one of the observations near the crack tip. Then people also have observed crack curving for all this you need to go for better models, people are now looking at influence of higher order terms only with that these directions could be predicted satisfactorily. So, this area is open for research, so I would appreciate that you consult the current literature to learn further. Now, we move on to the very important chapter on crack arrest and repair methodologies. What is the need for crack arrest? 
obviously by arresting the crack you would be able to enhance the life of the component. So, one of the goals of fracture mechanics is to extend the life of a component in the presence of inherent flaws, because if you look at many of the bridges built 50 to 60 years back now they are all developed cracks and if you do not salvage it you have to rebuild them. So, people are developing repair technology, so that they could extend the life for some more time saving enormous amount of cost. So, it is a very important area and fracture mechanics understanding helps in doing this. And we have always been looking at once a crack has been detected its growth needs to be monitored. We have also theories that say how the crack will grow. So, we will also know how to inspect at what intervals and so on and so forth. So, once you know how the crack is growing you take steps to stop an advancing crack. This is one approach other approach is delay the crack reinitiation time. So, how do you stop the crack introduce crack stiffeners and patches it is very obvious you know if you have a car and if you have a plastic cover to that it will invariably develop a crack. So, you should know how to stop it. So, the question is which way you will put the tape along the crack direction or perpendicular to it we will see an answer. Okay. Other measures could be to heal a crack you know this is catching up now the influences from biological systems people have also developed self healing composites. And you know in certain applications where it is not load bearing member necessary repair technologies can be applied to reuse the cracked component that is also needed you know like you stitch your cloth you also have metallic stitching there are companies ready to do this for a price. So, we will also have a brief look at that and what is the physics in crack arrest methodologies. So, we will go back to our understanding of uh, energy release rate and resistance we take a ideal brittle solid and what you are having here is for a given loading the g increases. So, crack advances and by some mechanism you are able to bring down g. So, what you will find is at some value of g the crack would start arresting and it would completely arrest at some other higher value. So, g and r concept is very useful to discuss the possibility of arrest. The energy availability is much below the resistance. So, the crack has to get arrested. So, you have initial critical crack as A c and at the start of arresting the length of the crack is A superscript b. When it becomes A superscript e the crack is fully arrested. So, you should have a mechanism by which bring down the g that is done effectively by putting a patch you put a patch g can be brought down. Now, the question is what should be the size what should be the location what should be the material there are so many parameters attached to it. This basically illustrates the principle in crack arrest I must bring down the value of g that is a physics. and we will see what way we can do. If you really go back to your uh, knowledge of the double cantilever beam specimen, the parameters the geometrical parameters of the specimen can be suitably selected to have either a constant g or a decreasing g as a function of crack growth. On that basis you could perform an experiment and satisfy that crack arrest is possible. The other approach is put a patch 
So, you have an external patch that is put and what you find here is the patch is more effective if the crack tip is slightly ahead of the patch A B. That means, do not put the patch here, put it somewhere here. Essentially, you are increasing the stiffness in that location, so that uh, the energy release rate comes down and this is the same graph that you had seen earlier. So, because of the patch, you know when the crack has come to this, you will have a crack getting arrested. Then as the load is increased, the crack can again reinitiate and grow further and you know for all this, we have earlier looked at the severity of crack from photoelastic fringe pattern. We would also investigate the effectiveness of a patch from photoelastic fringe pattern and once I say a patch, I can put it on both sides or one side all these variations are possible. So, we would see how photoelastic fringes will look like. So, what you have here is you do not have to sketch this, this gives a indication I have a crack, how the patch is put, the patch is put perpendicular to the crack, this is the configuration which will help in arresting the crack we will see how the fringe patterns look like and all the parameters you know whether you can put patch on both sides. For example, if you are working on the aircraft components only one side is visible to you, other side you cannot access. So, I can put patch only on one direction. So, we will have to investigate whether putting a patch on one direction is sufficient enough for your given application. If possible you put patch on both sides you should have accessibility for that. And in fact, the aircraft manufacturers have really paid attention on several aspects of it, whether the patch should be of the same material as the base material or it should be made of a composite. Because when you have aluminum frame, they would try to put a patch made of glass fiber or Kevlar fiber or carbon fiber type of patch and see how the effective effectiveness of it what should be the length, what should be the width, these are all parameters. So, what we will see is we would just have a look at the fringe pattern that gives you enormous amount of information. So, I will take a fringe pattern somewhere here, I will put the similar load, I will put a similar load here. So, you could see from the size of the fringes, this is the unpatched specimen this you could sketch I would like you to sketch and this is the patch specimen on one direction this is the patch specimen on both the directions you could see the fringe has drastically come down obviously it indicates the stress intensity is low when you have two patch this goes with your common sense when you say that it is fully patched it has to be well protected. So, that is what you see here and this gives you dramatically it is a very carefully done experiment this was done by my student Madhu a very careful experimentalist and you have one patch here you have another patch. And I could also increase the load and show how it is. So, we have gone out to 0.79 MPA and this also you can see. So, at 0.79 MPA the fringe pattern is of particular size whereas, it is very very small when you have double patch. And you know these were calculated by photoelastic analysis you could see for uh, one case you collect data from the field this is reconstructed fringe pattern and the value of k 1 is 0 0.67 MPA root meter and k 2 
because of uh, small deviation of the crack as well as the loading, you have a very small value of k 2 percent that is 0 0.03 MPa root meter. So, it is possible by processing the photoelastic fringe pattern extracting the value of k 1 and k 2 from the field and uh, what I would like to show is a comparison in the form of uh, graph. This is more important you make a sketch of this. You have configurations listed on one axis, stress intensity factor is listed on the y axis. So, when you have a unpatched crack it is about 0.7 MPa root meter, one side patched it has come down to around 0.36 or so. When it is patched on both sides it is 0.15 or so. So, this shows crack arrest by patching is effective, patching brings down the value of stress intensity factor. So, it is a useful methodology. Another approach what people do is people use hole as a arrester. So, what you see here is I have a plate with a hole from which cracks have emanated. On one side you have a crack, on the other side the crack is stopped by a hole, a small hole is put. And why do you go for a hole? When you put a hole, the stress intensification comes drastically down to around 3, because it is a finite body it will be greater than 3. It is not infinite anymore theoretically, because at the crack tip you have infinite value of stresses. The moment you put a hole, and this is the reason you know when you have riveted joints, the riveted hole serves like a hole. So, it acts like a crack arrester, the reinitiation time is delayed, it may not have much change in the stress intensity factor, but the crack for it to grow further, it has to again initiate and then go. So, you delay the reinitiation time, so, that is the advantage of hole as a crack arrester. This is again done uh, by photoelastic analysis. You have the fringe patterns in dark field as well as bright field. You would not see much difference between the fringe pattern because the SIF value is not significantly altered. And you have taken uh, this, its close up views are shown, and these are the reconstructed fringe pattern from the data processed. One is for the actual crack, another is crack tip blunt by a hole, you do not find major difference in the SIF value. But what is the advantage of a hole is it delays the reinitiation period. You have K1 as 0 0.33 MPa root meter, when it is blunt by a hole, it is 0 0.265 MPa root meter. See these are all done on epoxy that is why you see such small values of stress intensity factor. It is not done on aluminum or steel there the values would be totally different. So, the effect of hole is to delay the reinitiation time original crack growth rate is like this. When you have a hole it will delay and then crack growth will be like this. So, this is the advantage you have, it delays the reinitiation time and this naturally happens when you have riveted joint, whatever the crack that is initiated by one hole it will come and stop at the other hole, then it will take some time for it to grow further. So, this was the difference when you have a welded joint once the crack starts propagating there is nothing to arrest, so crack will simply zip through. So, in the later ship designs people have provided crack arresters at appropriate locations, then welded ship also became very safe. So, this is what you have to keep in mind the reinitiation time is what is the gain that you get when you have a hole put at the end of the crack. And the next concept is 
self healing it is all precipitated by biological systems see what happens is when you have a fall you get a bruise and your system understands that this is where something has happened so you have skin is reformed only in that location how does this happen can this be mimicked in real structures particularly when you have a space exploration device which is made of composite you can't go to space and repair it has to repair by itself so in such exotic applications these concepts are tried structural polymers are susceptible to damage in the form of cracks which form deep within the structure where detection is difficult and repair is almost impossible in nature damage to an organism initiates a healing response so very similar to that when the damage occurs that should initiate a healing response that's the way people have looked at it okay that's what they have learned from living organism so this concept has been applied to synthetic material design and a self healing polymer has been developed and i could magnify it and then show the composite looks like this it is done at university of illinois professor sotos is credited with this contribution you have a crack and the crack also gets healed for which they have to fabricate the polymer in a particular fashion they have to embed the micro bubbles the micro bubbles will carry resin as well as hardener so when the crack goes and pierces the catalyst as well as the resin they get released and then healing takes place so you have to calculate whether you are able to statistically distribute this bubble satisfactorily all these are manufacturing issues the concept is like this so we'll just quickly see the concept so this is known as autonomic healing concept and what happens here is you have the polymer uh, system you have bubbles of various sizes the micro capsules carry resin as well as a catalyst so what happens is wherever there is crack growth the crack growth invariably bump a catalyst as well as a resin system so they come out and then seal it so that's a concept behind it it's patented and people are uh, developing it further because to make it commercial it has to work the concept is simple to appreciate so when the crack grows you have release of resin from this and uh, the catalyst uh, interacts with this and you have polymerization takes place and then healing takes place so the damage event precipitates healing action also there are several technological questions if you really look at if there's a gap here how this gap will behave so these are all issues people have to look at and what way these uh, micro bubbles have to be statistically distributed so in fabrication how they can ensure this these are all very difficult issues that you have to address while fabrication but the concept is very similar to how a biological system would respond healing takes place at the place where the damage has occurred so this finds application in deep space exploration satellites rocket motors prosthetic organs space stations of the present and the future bridges constructed of composite material you can list but the idea is this in places where you cannot go and inspect and do rectification if healing can take place and delay that itself is good enough and we also move on to the next concept of crack repair by metal stitching and what you will have to note is 
it is a highly skilled reliable and cold work mechanical process of repair by which cracked broken or blown out pieces of cast iron cast steel and aluminum housings are repaired you know this is a useful aspect though it doesn't come under the purview of fracture mechanics per se because you are really looking at the housing but this is very useful from practical application point of view because many people do not know that metal stitching is possible we all know only welding we have no bracing and so on metal stitching which is a cold operation is also possible and what this process involves is insertion of specially designed locks across the cracks in pre made slots these alloy locks have a resistance to tensile strain which is 3 to 5 times that of cast iron so you use a different material high strength material crack faces are brought into close proximity by specially designed threaded pins so you have locks as well as threaded pins that serves the purpose and here again you will find you will have a crack and you do the locks perpendicular to the crack so that you learn from fracture mechanics if you find a crack in your uh, car cover put your tape perpendicular to the crack it will stay for longer duration than putting it parallel so this is what the configuration of metal stitch is shown i have the crack i put it perpendicular to that and these locks have very special shape we'll have a look at it very special shape this is the top view you have a crack that is going through and you have this special lock it is not simple straight piece it is uh, machining itself is skilled you need to have this kind of machining and a typical lock would be like this shape is given here you have a lock that is uh, designed and you have to make a slit by appropriate tools on the component like this that is why you have specialized uh, companies which involve in this you make a sketch of this sketch of this uh, lock so this machining itself is going to be challenging and what they do is they put layers of this they have to drill it put one layer after the other and once they repair polish it and then paint it you will find as if it is a good component you will not be able to distinguish between broken and unbroken one so you have special drill jigs are used to create a precision hole pattern in the casting and let us see the sequence of operation you have to make the aperture because you have to drill it appropriately then insert these locks then you have to fix studs special studs are required to keep them in place then you do rough grinding smooth grinding and finishing so you have making aperture fixing lock locking studs and cleaning i'll redo the animation you just observe the sequence of operation you have to make special holes to put the locks they are called as special keys so you have to fix that then you have the locking studs then repair it and the courtesy goes to metal lock coat uk and you have the housing of the gearbox is shown here it is broken and this is stitched it is not painted if it is painted you will not be able to find out any difference and uh, what you have to keep in mind is this ensures 100 percent leak free repair with high degree of rigidity 
in equipments which are operated under higher pressure. The requirement is the minimum thickness of the material to be stretched is 9 millimeters and no upper limit for thickness. As the repairs are carried in cold process, no distortion or thermal stress is induced. That is the advantage. If you go for welding, you have distortion. So, that kind of uh, defect is not seen here. You know, this is the last class in this course. We have come a long way and we had uh, in detail seen the development of linear elastic fracture mechanics. Even the mathematical basis was. Uh, very thoroughly studied, even the derivations we have done to the last step. Then we moved on to concepts related to elastoplastic fracture mechanics. We looked at briefly J integral as well as CTOD. Then we also looked at uh, failure assessment diagram. Then we took up important aspect of which way the crack will grow in mixed mode fracture. We saw how mode 1 fracture toughness could be used in physical concept based uh, fracture theories. Later on people switched on to empirical approaches in which they had used both K 1 C as well as K 2 C. And in this class essentially we looked at crack arrest and repair methodologies. Crack arrest is possible by putting patches. This has found wide application in aerospace structures. What is the effect of putting patch on one side, putting patch on both sides? Then how does the hole helps in delaying the crack reinitiation? Then we also saw metallic stitching. So, we have looked at history on what prompted fracture mechanics to develop, mathematics and detailed derivations on several aspects of it. We have also gone to the extent of looking at application aspects of it. And this is a field which is developing, there is scope for uh, research. And you have to consult the recent uh, articles as well as books and there is lot more for you to read. I am sure whatever we have discussed it provide you enough basic understanding for you to read the current literature. Thank you.